Welcome to WWJT. In the 1990s, everyone was talking about Rick Warren and the purpose-driven life. In the 2000s, everyone was talking about Timothy Keller and the reason for God. In the 2010s, well, everyone was just arguing about race and Donald Trump. But in the 2020s, there is something new that is trending. Uh, and this new thing is an old thing. And according to our guest in this episode, that old thing is for today. Uh, Dr. Jess Jelstra is one of the leading scholars when it comes to this trending theological theological perspective found within the Reformed tradition. Not only that, she has a special focus on Christian ethics and what it means to imitate Jesus. Jess, thanks so much for joining us on this uh, episode of WWJT. Thanks for having me on. So we are a podcast, um, if you don't know, listeners out there, about following Jesus. What would Jesus tech? We like to think about technology. Today, we really want to focus in on that what would Jesus part, imitating Jesus. And uh, before we go into some of those questions, um, I I just wanted to ask a few questions to get to know you, Jess. Is that all right? Yeah, that's great. Quick questions. Favorite course you teach? Reformed theology. Okay. And that's at Redeemer (laughs) University in Canada. Um, Your favorite theologian outside of scripture? Herman Bobbing. Okay. Your favorite flower? Oh, uh, I would say tulip, tulip, but it's really not, but it it just feels (laughs) like it fits to say tulip. It's not. Um, that's a great question. I don't know that I know. I, you know, I I was inclined to say daisies, but I don't think that's true either. I I don't know. I need to think about that and probably should tell my husband once I figure it out. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) Um, your favorite thing about living in Canada? The snowstorm we just had last night. I I came from Canada uh, to Canada from California, so it's definitely not the snow. (laughs) But but I do I I really like the people. Um, I've I've only lived here for about six years, but have found folks at least in my area to be just kind, generous, capacious, and you know really interested in, in kind of questions of pluralism and how do we live together amidst deep differences, which is something I'm very interested in and live it out very interestingly, uh, kind of on the ground. What's your favorite app on your phone? Great question. Instagram. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> fair. Probably a common answer for sure. What was your favorite, uh, bracelet as a teenager? Kind of specific question there, but very specific. And I'm going to tell you what you want to hear, uh, because I also think it's true. It's the only bracelet I ever wore. Uh, and it was the, the embroidered WWJD bracelets, uh, that lots of people wore in the nineties. And I was one of them. Mm -hmm. And what's your favorite thing about studying church history? I just think it's so wonderful to see, see the ways that God works in the lives of his people and uses people to do his will. Um, you know, one of, one of the things you learn as you get to know great thinkers in church history is that they were people just like you and me. Uh, and they had some wonderful insights and they had some really problematic quirks uh, and some more problematic than others, but everyone has their quirks and their insecurities. Uh, and, you know, getting, getting to know these people through their reading, through, through what they've written, through what they've said, and finding out that they are humans, just like me, just like you, and yet God uses them in phenomenal ways uh, to testify to the goodness of, of who he is. And that is, I mean, both supremely humbling and encouraging to see the ways that God works through normal people. Hmm. Very cool. Some people, they kind of can push back against studying church history. They almost see it as, well, we should only look at the Bible. We shouldn't look at church history. Um, What do you say to people like that? You know, I think, I think the instinct is a very Protestant one. (laughs) Uh, You know, you, when you think of the Protestant Reformation, hopefully we would think of something like the solas. And one of those is sola scriptura. And so that idea has gotten a bit twisted in what it means, but it's a very Protestant kind of thing. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And underneath it, I think is this really important affirmation that the Bible is the supreme authority for all of, for all of life, for all of, for everything that is. The Bible is the supreme authority. Nothing is above it. And that is a good, right, and true thing. Uh, And first I want to do a full stop there, right? That when we say Bible, 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 
there's something really right under that, that the Bible is the supreme authority. Nothing can come close to it. Nothing can top it. Nothing can counter it. This is God's word for our lives, for every part of our life. And we should wholeheartedly affirm that. But when we start saying Bible, Bible, Bible alone, we forget that God works in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that, you know, you read something that's counter to the Bible and all of a sudden we're like, oh, this person said this Hmm, seems right. Let's go with it. But it does mean that God, God works, God speaks um, and God is active in his world. And so when people think sola scriptura, sometimes we do get it wrong to think we mean only scripture. But what it really means is that nothing is above the Bible. You can't say, well, the church has held this for 500 years, and so it must be true, even if we're kind of going to use scripture then to say, oh, this does not seem true. We need to rethink this. In the end, scripture is the thing that is true, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But that doesn't mean that God doesn't speak elsewhere. It simply means that God's revealed word in scripture is not going to be trumped by anything and cannot be trumped by anything. We check everything according to scripture, but it doesn't mean we can't consult other sources. And in fact, we should, right? Uh, if yeah. we if we understand ourselves as, as being members of Christ's church, one of the things that we really want to avoid is thinking that Christ's church is only the people who are here right now. Christ's mm-hmm. church expands to everyone who is in Christ. And that that is the people who have gone before us, who are now, to use a theological word, in the church triumphant, who are before the face of God. But they, their words matter, and they're part of our body of Christ. And so to, to be, I, I think, to do service to the people that Christ has, has gathered among himself as our brothers and sisters, we need to look at what they've said how they've felt the presence of the risen Christ, how they've interpreted God's word, how they've applied it to very particular situations in their own times and places and say, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And they are telling me something really important. Is that more important or could that correct God's revealed word? No, but it is really important. Uh, and, And frankly, I think it's part of what it means to be a Christian in the church universal or the church lowercase c Catholic is saying, these are my brothers and my sisters, and we will, we will learn what it means to follow Christ together. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost I mean, like, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, for me, um, kind of, I haven't done, let's say a lot of reading since I don't even know university in grade 12, where I learned about like, yeah, the Protestant reformation and everything like that. So even prepping for this episode, when I started seeing terms like um, Catholic, I was so <laughs> thrown off. So like for people who maybe don't have um, that background, could you explain how Catholic, as I kind of read recently, means just biblical? Yeah. So this is one of those words that does trip people up, especially people within the Protestant tradition, uh, because we often think of Catholic and we think of the Catholic Church, which makes sense. It's in the name. Uh, But there's another way of understanding the word Catholic. uh, And people like Herman Bobbink, who I I study in particular, use this phrase all the time, the Catholicity of the church. But it's not just Herman Bobbink. I mean, we see this in the creeds and the church's confessions. I believe Mm -hmm. in one holy apostolic Catholic church. That's a small c Catholic, but it does mean Catholic as in universal, the church that spans all times and places. And Bobbing has this wonderful essay called The Catholicity of Christianity and the Church, where he talks about a number of different meanings of the word Catholic. And again, this is all small c Catholic. So he's not denying that there's a Roman Catholic church. Absolutely. But he's talking about small c Catholic as in universal. And he says, you know, we need to think about that as the church encompassing all times and all places. Uh, So the church as in those who have gone before us in faith, those who will come after us, the church, as in the church in Canada and the church in all times and all places, this is Christ's one church. But then he also says the Catholicity of the church means that the, ter- that, that the gospel embraces all of our life and it has a word for all of our life, right? The gospel is not simply about what happens on Sunday and what happens when we do our personal devotions. The gospel matters and has a word for our tech use. The gospel has a word for how we parent. The gospel has a word for how we garden. The gospel has a word for how we play. The gospel has a word for everything because it is Catholic, all-encompassing, universal. Cool. Mm-hmm. And so 
this language, I think, throws people off. So they'll see that you are the author, co-author of a book that's called Calvinism for a Secular Age. So not only are you using a term like Calvinism right in the title, but you're also saying it's for an age like ours, a secular age. Um, how do you how do you defend such an audacious title? <laughs> First, I'll tell you, my husband picked the title, uh, <laughs> who is my co-editor, but I, I wholeheartedly endorse it. Um, you know, I, I am an unabashed Calvinist uh, that to use the language, um, I, I got this from my mentor, Richard Mao, who got this from from other people. He writes about this uh, in a little book, Calvinism in the Las Vegas Airport, which is a great book if you're interested in some of the particulars of Calvinism on salvation, which is where people often get hung up on Calvinism. But what I don't mean by Calvinist is a kind of exclusive claim that says anyone that doesn't interpret scripture exactly as I do as a Calvinist is outside the bounds of Christianity. What I do mean is as I have understood scripture and understood kind of what God is saying, the the best way for me to understand and articulate that and the most faithful way that I know how is in Calvinism. Um, That I am first and foremost a Christian, uh, but the, the way that I live out that Christian faith is found in the Protestant world. The way that I live out that Protestant Christianity, the kind of accent that I have there is a Calvinist accent. And to get even more specific, it's a neo-Calvinist accent. Um, And all of that is to say everyone has an accent when they talk theologically, right? We as Christians don't just kind of say things as as though we've kind of been unformed or, you know, ungrouped. Uh, We we are formed, whether whether we know it or not. We are formed by different ecclesial traditions. We are formed by different ways of understanding and interpreting scripture. And we are all, those of us within, again, small c Catholic Christianity, we are all normed and guided by these basic Christian fundamental primary beliefs. But we have certain accents on them. And the accents that I play up um, are, are generally Calvinist accents. What that doesn't mean, too, is that I don't want to learn from other accents. I absolutely do. But I think it it's really helpful to say, this is where I'm coming from. And where I'm coming from is 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 a Calvinist. Uh, that's That's who I am. And so I Try not to apologize for it too much. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's good for me who I've, you know, been in Reformed churches, Protestant churches, Pentecostal, all, all different things growing up. So I think even recently in our last episode, I had to go through a little bit of processing of like, what does evangelical really mean? Mm-hmm. And after some clarification, I was like, oh yeah, okay. Like I can proudly wear that um, yeah. badge because it does, you know, live up to the values I hold. So I think it's definitely important for, you know, people to understand the framework, but also uh, Andrew is mentioning earlier, there's like having these clarities on worldviews, I can use that term, um, can help us like think about the tools to think through um, the modern day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that's where some of the work that you're doing with Herman Bovink he wrote a hundred years ago, but when I read him, it feels like he wrote it just yesterday like he's talking about the changes in modernity he's talking about this this anxious self almost he doesn't i don't know if the word anxious is is there but just like the way in which we do things that aren't tied together to one another and so he this is in christian worldview that i was reading recently and it's like mm-hmm. oh man like he is speaking in such helpful language even though he wrote a hundred years ago Mm-hmm. And same with Kuiper, who the book focuses more on Kuiper's lectures. Um, but why do you think that they're just so good at articulating things that seem so relevant to us today? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll I'll just affirm that instinct as well. I remember so many times we're just finishing up translating uh, Bavink's Reformed Ethics and, and putting it into a, a manuscript and, and a book in English. Well, three volumes, two are out in the world. One, one more is coming. And there were so many times where we would sit around the table as an editorial team and just kind of say, you know, it, it feels like he's speaking to one of the things that, you know, we've, we've been talking about around the table because it's in the news. Uh, it feels so relevant because it is so relevant. Uh, and, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. And the first is that Bob Inc. and Kuiper self-consciously understood themselves to be modern people. Uh, so mm-hmm. they, you know, when we think about Bavink and Kuiper, we're thinking about a particular theological trend and branch that is neo-Calvinism. And that's not to be confused with other kinds of 
new Calvinism things. People use that language for a lot of different things. What I'm talking about when I say neo-Calvinism is this theological movement championed by Bavink and Kuyper in the Netherlands in, in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and, and what they were doing was ex- explicitly and self-consciously reflecting on what it meant that they were Christians living in their time. And they were Christians living in the modern world, reflecting on modern challenges, thinking about those modern challenges mm-hmm. very seriously, appreciating the benefits and, and, and beauty of the modern world, which is something I imagine we'll talk about soon, because that includes some of the major technological developments that were happening around them. But they were very self-consciously saying, I am orthodox and modern, which has, by the way, been a, quite a quite a debate in Bavink studies to say, how does this stuff come together, right? Um for a little bit of history, I won't go too far, but I'll go a little bit. For a little yeah. bit of history, Bavink, Bavink grew up in in the in in the Horefemira, which is kind of Christian Reformed, but not the Christian Reformed we find on this side of the pond, which is the Christian Reformed Church in North America. But he grew up in this small Christian and Reformed uh, denomination, which was quite conservative, had some Pietistic strands, um, and and had kind of very Orthodox theological training. It was it was conservative, reformed, orthodox, whatever language you kind of want to put on it. Uh, And he later on goes to study at a a very liberal university. And when I say liberal, I mean, I mean, like theologically liberal in the modern time, which is to say, you know, questions about Jesus's divinity and scriptures, uh, is scripture written by God? Or is this a human kind of thing? Those were the kinds of questions that they were grappling with. So it's not necessarily what we think of as liberal Christianity automatically in in North America today. It's kind of that technical, theological, liberal movement in Christianity Mm -hmm. in in the modern time. And he goes to this school and people are really worried. (laughs) Uh, They say, you know, is he going to deny these basic claims of reformed orthodoxy that he's held, that we as a church hold, that how, how is he going to understand the relationship between this very academic, modern, liberal stuff that he's being schooled in and the confessional orthodox reformed training of his youth. And Bobink, and, and so sometimes in Bobink thought, especially about a decade and earlier, a, a decade ago and earlier, people thought he was kind of this Jekyll and Hyde character that, you know, he goes to his modern self where he's engaging modern theologians like Schleiermacher and he's appreciating them and he's using their tools and these robust academic tools. So sometimes he's modern and then sometimes he's really confessional and orthodox and he doesn't really reconcile the two was, was kind of the going idea. And, and a thinker named James Eglinton, who's a, who's a wonderful Bavink scholar, just did a fantastic biography of Bavink that I highly commend to you. If this is at all interesting to you. <laughs> um, he, he has been the one to very definitively show Bavink is both modern and orthodox. He is self-consciously taking those, those theological traditions that he has inherited that have gone from time and place before him to his moment. So he's he's reformed, he's affirming the confessions, he's affirming these orthodox teachings, and he's trying to make sense of them as a person that is self-consciously modern. He's doing so in dialogue with modern phenomena in kind of the technological and cultural changes that are happening in his time and in the theological kind of discourse of his time. And he's doing that together. It's not an either or, it's a both and for him. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing I'd say very quickly is you know, our title comes, Calvinism in the Secular Age, is a riff off Charles Taylor's famous book, The Secular Age. Uh, that's something my husband has actually written quite a lot on, uh, and something both of us find very important. Uh, a number of Reformed theologians and philosophers have, have taken his work quite seriously, including people like Jamie Smith, people like Justin Bailey. Uh, and, and Taylor says, we are living in a secular age. And what he means by that, uh, and Jamie Smith very nicely details kind of these different understandings of secular. One of them could be, here's the work of the priest, here's the work of the, the baker and the butcher and the candlestick maker, and those are separate. Everything that has to do with kind of baker, butcher, candlestick maker, secular, what happens in the church, sacred. That's not what Taylor means. <laughs> Uh, Mm -hmm. what Taylor means, or just secular as in this kind of naked public square where there's this neutrality, again, not what Taylor means. What Taylor means is an appeal to the saculum, the here and now, to say our kind of social imaginary, the way that we view the world as Christian or people today in the West, is in some ways kind of collapsed into a one-dimensional thing or a one-tier thing where we're focused on what's here and now. And so faith is not un- 
unbelievable, but it's difficult. It's tenuous because we're focused on what's here, what's now, what we can touch, what we can feel, what we can see. And there's a lot more he says about that. But one of the (laughs) realities that I think is true of both Bavink and Kuiper's time and our own is that that was true then and it is true now. Uh, yeah. We they were they were while no one was kind of naming it a secular age, they were living in in a time that had those impulses not unlike our own, where there's a lot of focus on what's here and now or the seculum, uh, and and there's less thought of what could be beyond what we touch, taste, feel, smell, uh, and so while our times are very different, and I don't want to don't want to disregard the major differences between when Bavink and Kuiper lived and when we did, when we live now, there's also some deep similarity. Uh, and I think we see that as we read them. Mm-hmm. I, I love what you were saying, kind of how Bavink was trying to hold, and he did hold to modernity and orthodoxy. And I think about someone working in technology, doing the same thing, being like, I work in technology, like I'm an entrepreneur and I actually am an entrepreneur. I don't have to like put a big Christian label in front of that and add a whole bunch of caveats. Like I am an entrepreneur. I am a Christian. I hold to both. Now there might be ways that those intersect and working those out is, is sometimes the difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Now you have an interest in, in imitating Jesus. And this goes into some of the studies that you've done historically. Um, I, I was wondering if you could kind of share the story of how you, you got interested in that and, and I, I mean, this is a larger conversation, but but what does it look like to imitate Jesus in a secular age? Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> so I was a kid in the 90s, uh, and I, I was in West Michigan at the time in the States. And one of the things that was kind of all around the States, but was particularly intense in my area was these WWJD bracelets. Uh, they you know, they were these little cloth things that tons of people wore. And, and they became kind of this weird cultural phenomenon. Uh, it started in this little reformed church, actually, in Holland, Michigan, uh, really? by a, a youth pastor named Shaney Tinkleberg. Uh, she, she had someone make little bracelets for her youth group uh, because they had read, she had read this, this story uh, from Charles Sheldon, who was actually a modern liberal theologian, uh, who, <laughs> who was talking about imitating Christ. She found it very interesting. Uh, so she she took up that charge to ask her youth group to say, what would Jesus do as they were making decisions? And it kind of swept the nation. And my sense is it went beyond the states, but I I don't know oh, that yeah. that well. Oh, yeah. I the think it was in Canada, too. In Canada yeah. too. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I, had a, uh, I, I wore one for a while, for sure. Oh, that's it, great. It was, it was really a cool, you felt like it was a cool Christian thing. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know. But it, like, it was in a society. huge thing. Yeah. yeah. And it went beyond kind of Christian circles at some points. I mean, there were there were advertising campaigns that were, you know, what would basketball players do? Insert the actual basketball player's name. And it went all over. It was used in presidential campaigns. It went crazy. Uh, but it was this also unique youth group phenomenon. And I was a youth group kid at the time that the, this youth group phenomenon was in vogue. And so I have pictures still to this day of me as a teenager with this kind of band around my wrist. And in fact, I used one as I was. Um, back in the day presenting my my dissertation re- research at the defense you know this is where it started me uh 13 year old me with this little bracelet and mm. and eventually i stopped wearing the bracelet uh and and i stopped asking the question because you know if if you kind of press that what would jesus do and you use it in isolation it's a really hard thing to ask right so what would jesus do and and this was the kind of both superficial and true challenge that I had somewhat formulated. I don't want to say I'd formulated it very well. I was still a teenager, Uh, but I'd somewhat formulated, you know, what would Jesus do? And so say I'm at the beach and my uncle goes on the sea do and I wanted to be on that site sea do, what would Jesus do? Well, he might walk on water and I can't, or, (laughs) you know, you can, you can multiply these, but it's really difficult to ask that question. What would Jesus do without a really, really kind of without a firm infrastructure of hermeneutical assumptions and, and, and claims that undergird it. And I didn't have that. (laughs) Uh, And in in many ways, that's because I grew up reformed and as, as a reformed Christian, 
much of the time when we are asked to think about questions of ethics and questions about how I ought to live, we're directed to the law, to the Ten Commandments. Um, and interestingly, fun fact, in, in Tingleberg's church, uh, they, they actually had a series on what would I do at the same time that these bracelets were coming out. And no one once mentioned the imitation of Jesus. They mentioned the law. Uh, and they huh. talked about Paul a little bit. But so th- a, a reformed kind of intuition does not lead you necessarily, though I argue it, it should if you actually look far enough back. Well, and I felt this, just to jump in briefly, I felt this, I was listening to the White Horse Inn with Michael Horton, Mm -hmm. who I really respect. And this is like late 2000s, 2008, 2009. And, um, you know, there's, there's other speakers at that time, Mark Driscoll, Rob Bell, lots of people saying what the gospel is. And then Michael Horton says definitively, definitively what the gospel is. And I'm so appreciating it. And he makes statements like the most important thing in the reformed tradition is not what would Jesus do, but what did Jesus do? It's about his death and resurrection. That's what matters. And I remember kind of being a cage stage Calvinist, (laughs) looking down on the idea of imitating Jesus, because what matters is the gospel and being saved. And the gospel is that, and that's what we need to get right. We need, we can't be thinking, you know, and not, and, and there's, there's nuance to that. And I think Michael Horton is great, but I did come away sometimes from some episodes feeling like the WWJD bracelet would be a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there are real challenges, right? I mean, if, if you look at even the roots of WWJD, it's, it's rooted in this Christological understanding that does have Jesus as kind of merely a man that is an example that we should follow and we can follow. Uh, and there, of course, the reformed tradition and kind of again, small C Catholic interpretation from from all times and all places would push back to say, no, it's because of Christ's work in us that we can do anything. And when the Mm reform tradition says, what can we do or what ought we do? Again, there's an immediate move to the law, to the 10 commandments, right? You think about something like the Heidelberg catechism, people have nice acronyms for it, like guilt, grace, gratitude, sin, salvation, service. Uh, and, And all of those say, you know, who are you? And then what has Christ done? And then what ought we do? And it's respond with gratitude and lives of service and in lives of devotion. And how do we do that? How do we know how to live the Ten Commandments? And that's not wrong. <laughs> I want to say that right, very clearly. Right, of course. I, I think that's absolutely right. But it doesn't leave a lot of space usually for the imitation of Christ. When we say, how do we live? How should we live? We should live according to the law. Uh, you see that in people like Lou Smeads, who's a wonderful uh, reformed ethicist. He He's passed on now, uh, but he he wrote a book called Mere Morality, What God Expects from Ordinary People. And he goes through the law to say, how do we know what God expects? We know because God has told us. Where has he told us in this law? Uh, and so all of that kind of both the superficial challenges of how do you know what Jesus would do, right? Jesus lived a long time ago. He didn't have some of the particular cultural challenges we have. He had supernatural ability. He's not just a human, he's God. Uh, Plus this kind of emphasis on the law led to me not really knowing how to take seriously that question. Um, Mm -hmm. And in some ways thinking maybe the question itself is a bad question. Um, Like it sounds like perhaps you were led to think too. Mm -hmm. And I no longer think it's a bad question. But I think it's a question that we need to understand a little bit more. And we need to understand what the kind of hermeneutical keys are for making sense of that question. Because the reality is throughout church history, and people like Bob Inc. make this point, but he doesn't make it in isolation. Lots of people do as they kind of survey church history. The reality is people have had hermeneutical guides for that question from day one. Uh, So Bob Inc., when he looks through church history, say people have always tried to imitate Christ, right? This wasn't a thing that started with Thomas Akempis, though it did become widely popularized with Thomas Akempis's Imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. But it's way back to the beginning. He, he, he charts out a number of trends throughout church history, the martyr, the mystic, the monk, and the modern man. He doesn't actually use modern man for the last one, but I think you need the extra M. So that's totally, what he means. Totally. Um, 
And so he says throughout church history, we've seen this pop up. It started at the very beginning where Stephen, if you look at uh, Stephen, the martyr's witness if in, in Acts and, and, and then in, in early Christian retelling, you see him using the language of Christ. You see him appealing to right. the kind of posture of Christ. And, and this takes on a wide phenomenon in Christian circles. How do we imitate Christ? We imitate him through capitulating and, and kind of doing his dying as he did, being like Christ unto death, and that is death as a martyr. And that can be Hmm. something wonderful, right? Boving says, look at the martyrs and see their courage, see their faith. They did not recant the gospel of Christ, even when it came down to their life or a recanting. What wonderful faith and courage. But he also said, there's a caution we need to have here, because this can lead to a glorified view of suffering and death. We, we are told in the Gospels that we will suffer, but we aren't told suffer is the thing that we glory in unto all. We should seek out death. Um, mm-hmm. that, that's not what the Gospels say. And, and, and Bavink argues, as do many other theologians, that it, this kind of exaltation of martyrdom, again, has beautiful, can, can be kind of beautiful, that there's faith and courage. But they say it might also lead a a believer to seek out suffering. And suffering isn't a good in and of itself. It's what we are suffering for, not suffering itself. But they say- And I've heard some people say like, oh, we should get persecuted in Canada. That'll be a good thing. We want to suffer for the sake of Mm -hmm. the gospel spreading. And it's like, wait, 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 we shouldn't be asking for suffering. That's not like if it happens, we can glorify God through it. But yeah, no, your nuance is helpful. And, and so they say, even from the beginning, from early Christian history, people are imitating Christ. How are they imitating him? What's the kind of hermeneutical key by which we imitate? It's Christ's mm-hmm. death. So we imitate him as martyrs. And then you look at the, the, the cultural landscape for Christians and it shifts. Uh, suddenly things aren't so bad. Persecution isn't so rampant. And there's there's a lot more wealth there. People are doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, and and Bobbing says, you know, even even the church can can get a bit worldly then uh, as we kind of move on through church history. And then something else of Christ's is glorified as kind of the hermeneutical key by which we imitate him. And that's the monastic kind of angle of Christ. Mm. Christ Christ is 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 to be imitated in his poverty, in his chastity. Uh, and, and it leads to this kind of literal replication of Christ's movements, barefoot wandering in the desert, itinerant preaching. And again, those things aren't bad in and of themselves, but this movement within church history says, you know, that's kind of the way we imitate Christ. Before, how do we imitate Christ in his death? Now, how do we imitate Christ in his poverty, in his chastity, in his obedience, in his kind of barefoot itinerant preaching? Uh, Again, not a bad thing, but it is Mm -hmm. at one point in church history, the way we imitate Christ. And then he says, there's there's another way that later on in church history, now we're getting to kind of the Thomas Akempis stage, imitate Christ in his mysticism, in his union with Christ. Uh, so rich prayer life, detachment from the world, surrender to God, all of those things, again, not bad, but right. in one period of church history, the way to imitate Christ. And then in the modern age, imitate Christ in his actions as a man. And all of those Bobbing says he doesn't have a lot to say, actually, that's good about the modern way of imitating Christ. But for the rest of them, he has some things to say. There's some really good here and there's some real problems. Um, And and he wants to say all of these tie us too closely to a particular action of Christ and don't help us kind of flesh out the full picture of how we imitate Christ. Because we don't, he says, simply imitate Christ in death simply imitate Christ in suffering, simply imitate Christ in poverty and and chastity, simply imitate Christ in in kind of mystical union. And he has other critiques of some of these, you know, kind of two-tiered morality where some people like monks are are single like Christ, other people have to have families to (laughs) keep humanity going. So there's lots of, that's what he says there, but he wants to say all of them fall short. And so he does this in a number of essays to say, "These, these cannot be our final guides. And in the end, as kind of coming back to that reformed emphasis on the law, he wants to say, how do we imitate Christ? We imitate Christ as he follows the law, which is a kind of, I I think, a wonderful picture to say, who is Christ? Christ is our living law. 
The law Mm -hmm. no longer comes to us on stone tablets. It comes to us in a person who gives us concrete examples of what obedience to that law looks like. But what, one of the things he does then is be very, very clear that we aren't given a kind of prescribed, you must do this now, but we are given concrete examples of what that obedience looks like. And those concrete examples have a kind of contextual flexibility. And that doesn't mean a kind of subjectivity of norms or of right and wrong, right? The law always guides us. The law, what God has said is right Mm -hmm. and true and wrong and bad. Those always guide us. But we have a kind of contextual adaptability to say, what does this require in my time? What does this require in these particular challenges? And the models that Bob Inc. looks at in church history before didn't do that, right? There wasn't an adaptability. It was to be like Christ is to be martyred. To be like Christ is to be poor. And again, those aren't bad things in and of themselves, but they don't have this kind of contextual adaptability to say, what are the guiding norms that God has given us? What does Christ example, exempt, it, it, what is he an exemplar of that we can follow? Because again, here, here Bob Inc. saying then too, there are things that we cannot follow, right? We're not going to be like Christ in offering an atoning death for his people. We can't do that. Nope. There are things that only Christ can do. And he, in this, he's kind of summarizing um, and building on John Calvin, who has this wonderful line where he says, we are called to be imitators, not apes. And what he means by that is we're not just giving a kind of thoughtless following to the particulars of Jesus' life, right? Because I, mm. I as someone living in 21st century in Canada, can't do everything that Jesus did because my context is wildly different. Um, so even if I wanted to be exactly like Jesus, I probably couldn't walk on the roads that Jesus walked on, pick from the trees that Jesus picked from. They might not exist anymore. Um, but I can be like Jesus. How do I do that? By following Jesus as he follows the law. And then later in this wonderful essay from 1918, Bobbing continues to kind of clarify that by saying, Christ shows us the virtues that the law calls us to. And what are mm. we to do? We are to apply those virtues, apply the norms that the laws has given us in our own time and place. And so he gives us both, Jesus is a concrete example of what the law calls us to, but not the thing that we just kind of mindlessly follow. He's the one that we imitate in our own time and in our own place. And that, that may mean doing something different, but not doing something outside the bounds of what the law has said and how Christ has has exemplified those virtues. Yeah. I think what an, it's, aw- what an yeah, awesome yeah, answer. Really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the church history, the way you answered that. Anyway, sorry, go Joel. <laughs> no, I, I, same thing. I think actually it's also really relevant, especially now um, for technologists like myself, what we're seeing is technology is moving faster and, you know, ever faster, right? It just keeps accelerating its pace. And what we're seeing in, you know, uh, governmental law or like law in these countries is that they can't keep up, Mm. right? And there's this almost like beauty in realizing that like the law that we can see in scripture is transcendent Mm -hmm. to time versus like the human made law isn't. And it's like, as technologists, as people thinking about how do we create technology using that as a framework, like the Christian uh, law as a framework, is a lot more valuable than trying to lean on anything else that we have at this time. Mm. And I think that for me is really helpful to think about and like really understand as we're creating like AI, right. As we're Mm. creating like new inventions and like uh, different forms of energy and stuff like that. So Mm. I think that's very, very helpful. Mm. Yeah. And like, it's not wrong to follow Jesus and try to follow his example. Obviously, Paul did this. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting just the context of that in terms of like 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. And then that's the first verse after. And it's the context of the flexibility that Paul encourages Christians to have in different contexts. In 1 Corinthians 9, it's him being all things to all people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so there is that that kind of following Jesus that has some flexibility, but I like how you caveat that with, that's not a subjectivity. You still mm-hmm. have the law guide in. Um, so, so what would you think of 
today, when we think about tech use, when we think about whether or not we should use our apps, you know, should we limit our screen time because we know it's bad for us, you know, okay, maybe there's some virtues we should pursue. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's different ways to pursue following Jesus's example. Um, what what thoughts would you have on on bringing it into the day to day life? Uh, yeah, wonderful tech. So, I mean, Bobak does place imitation centrally. He says imitation is the shape of the Christian life. And so if that's Hmm. true, and I I think he's right, if that's true, then all of our life should be imitating Christ, including how we use tech. And this comes back to our discussion, I think, on on Catholicity, because what what the the Calvinist tradition, and in particular, the neo-Calvinist tradition, is, is really loudly proclaiming is that the gospel has a word for everything. In that essay in, on Catholicity, Bobbing says the gospel is joyful tiding, not only for the church, but for the family and society and education. He goes on, I'm sure. Um, but he says the gospel is joyful tiding for everything. And so that should mean and does mean that it's joyful tiding for our cultural development, for our technological development. Uh, and, and so it's not like this is technology is somehow this bracketed off area that we can kind of go with the flow say you know that this is this this seems like what people are doing now so wonderful because the gospel's over there what we want to say first and foremost is the gospel has a word for for our tech use and then secondly imitating christ shapes our tech use what does that look like though i mean that's that's the trickier question and a couple of thoughts and and all of them will connect back to imitating Christ. Um, but when we're talking about this imitation of Christ, Bob Inc. brings us back to the law. And there's an, a neo-Calvinist thinker named Albert Walters uh, who, who wrote this wonderful book called Creation Regained. And in it, he talks quite a lot about law. Uh, and, and he says, God is the law giver. And we often think about the laws that God has given his creation in terms of things like laws of gravity and laws of, you know, X, Y, or Z that just keep happening, right? As, as much as I might want to, if I throw my, if I hold out my pen and let it go, it's going to drop to the ground. Um, or, you know, as, as much as I might think about it happening otherwise, you know, the, the sun's going to keep going, the nitrogen cycles are going to keep going, all of these things keep going because they're laws of, of creation. But Al says then, you know, there are also laws that God has given us for our, for our societal patterning. Uh, and, and those laws attend to everything in creation. But he says the difference there is we can and do disobey. Uh, and so what he wants to say is God has lawed and normed all of creation. And, and one of the beautiful things about God's providence, uh, God's ongoing grace to his world is that even, mm. even in the midst of human sin, God still upholds those, those structures uh, of creation. And, and Walters introduces this wonderful structure direction distinction to say God has built creation. God has structured creation in such a way. God has normed and given laws and patterns. And that, that, that continues despite human sin that continues. But he says, one of the things that that we need to take into very serious consideration then is not only structure to say God has a structure for creation. And that includes things like how we do technology, how we do family, how we do business, but there's also direction. And we are often misdirected, directed against God, directed against his way and will. And so one of the things that I think that one of the guiding principles that I would think about in terms of tech use is to say, this is God's good world. Uh, and so that means, I think in some ways, we ought not be afraid uh, because these are God's good gifts. Bob Inc. says anything good, and he he explicitly references technology in some of this, is a gift from the father of lights. And so there is creational goodness. There's creational goodness when we think about, you know, the, the latent potentiality in creation that led us to the bits and bytes of computers, and I'm going to stop talking about specifics now because that will make me look very silly very soon. But though that kind of development was latent in creation, was a potential that God had built in. Mm. But we also need to take seriously then that God's good design has been thwarted and misdirected. 
And one of one of the one of the kind of taglines that um, another neo Calvinist thinker says often related to this is that everything is religious, which is to say everything has a direction. So I can't look at something like a computer or an app and say it's neutral and it's just how I use it. How I use it is really important, and I ought to imitate Christ in how I use it. But we also ought to have Christians thinking about imitating Christ and how they design things. There's this wonderful new book, Christian Field Guide to Technology uh, mm-hmm. by Derek Sherman and a couple other folks uh, who kind of calls us to think that way. How do we design in a way that is in line with God's creational intent, that is in line with God's laws? How do we imitate Christ in our designing? And so I think that conversation needs to be two ways to say, I am going to imitate Christ as I use technology. And I'm going to, if I'm a designer, seek to imitate Christ as I design technology. And I'm also then as a user going to say, I'm going to look for how these are directing me. What is Instagram kind of prompting me to do? What is it prompting me to think about? Because it's not simply neutral. <laughs> Nothing yeah. is, says Runner, says Bavink. Nothing is neutral. Everything has a direction. Everything is either towards God's created intent, towards God and his glory, or away. And so how do, how, do I, how do I discern and how do I use these tools? Part of it is thinking through, what are they, how are they prompting me? How are they guiding me? And if they are guiding me in, in problematic ways, how can I, how can I place right constraints on that. But what it doesn't mean is a kind of cultural isolationist that says, if this is not made by a Christian who's not seeking to imitate Christ in in how he or she designs, then I cannot use it. Um, Bob Inc. has this wonderful essay called Modernism and Orthodoxy. And in it, he spends just, and it's a theological lecture, and in it, he spends just a shocking amount of time talking about microscopes and telescopes. Um, about how they've unveiled to us this immense world. And in them, we can see something of the glory of creation. We can see how immense Mm -hmm. and big it is. And we can also see how limitless and immeasurable is is the language that he uses is as we examine how small and, and the kind of microscopic bits of this world. And so we're not saying, you know, if it's not created by a Christian, full stop, don't engage. Because again, all good things are from the father of lights. But what yeah. we are saying is how how do we discern the non-neutrality of things? How do we say, I'm going to look at anything, technology included, and say, this is religious? And then how do I, as a person seeking to faithfully engage both where God continues to say, yes, this is my good creation, and no, this is misdirected against, away from my will. How do I see both of those things? And how does that kind of make me say both yes and no to these pieces and these mm. these apps and these things. You, you've just helped a, a penny drop for me in my mind saying all things are religious because I've preached Psalm 103 a bunch of times and I've never known what to do with the last two verses. Mm. Like it says, praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion Mm. and you know and even colossians 1 talks about god reconciling all things to himself and you know joel and i were talking after an episode one time about like so wait does that mean that technology is going to be praising god in heaven Mm. and wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? And 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 you've just kind of unlocked it for me that everything is religious. Everything has a direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, I can say with more clarity now, praise the Lord, all his works. I want my mm-hmm. computer to praise God. I want my iPhone to praise God. I want my apps to praise God. I want my coffee mug to praise God. All his, every, every tool technology mm-hmm. um, to exist for the praise of his glory. Um, and I think that's, I think Calvinism gets treated in this, like, like a, like a single flower instead of a garden. Mm. It gets treated like a tulip and mm-hmm. as if that's all Calvinism has to offer when there's so much more about God's sovereignty. And I, I appreciate your caveats. Obviously, you you don't need to be a Calvinist to be a Christian, but there's so much that Calvinism offers to see the whole garden 
for being God's garden. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, I just love how you've uh, articulated that and helped us. Um, we don't have much time left. Any resources that you would recommend people go to? You reference. I mean, I'm going to link to some of these. I'll go back through. I'll listen to the episode again, and I'll link the yeah. various things that you referenced, so that people will be able to easily look at the show notes and see that the Catholicity um, essay that Bob Inc. wrote is actually for free, or at least it's mm-hmm. I I got it for free somehow yeah. off the internet, <laughs> and I I read that one, and that one's an amazing one. That was my first read of Bob Inc., and I was like, oh, oh wonderful. One of my he, favorites. He just, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And I was like, I came out of it being like, oh, he's just like a Bible guy. <laughs> like he just he just reads the Bible well. And that kind of helped me get into him. Um, but what other resources would you recommend to people? Obviously, your book would be a great starter for people too. Um, Calvinism in a secular age. Yeah, wonderful. Um, a couple of things come to mind. That that essay on Cal- on on modernism and orthodoxy from Bob Inc. is is another one. I think Bobbing's biography from James Eglinton, if you're ready for, you know, 400 pages of, of great riches, uh, including some of Bobbing's love poems as a teenager. Uh, so that <laughs> is enticing. Um, but that's that's a wonderful resource. One of the things uh, that I was, and, and I also mentioned Al Walter's Creation Regained, another really great resource, kind of the basics of a, I think the, the subtitle is Basics of a Reformational Worldview. Um, he talks about kind of this creation, fall, redemption, restoration paradigm and what that means and how that plays out. Um, and then, you know, it, in it, as it applies to technology, one of the people that I think is doing the best work on this is Derek Sherman, who's at Calvin University. He has uh, shaping a digital world that kind of plays out those, those mm-hmm. really helpful insights that Walters gives us, plays them out into our use of technology. And then his new book, Christian Field Guide to Technology, as you were talking about, um, you know, how will how will things like computers show up uh, in 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 God's good kingdom when it is when it is fully consummated? Made me think of one of my favorite little books. Uh, it's it's called When the Kings Come Marching In, and it's it's a it's a reflection by Richard Mao on Isaiah sixty. Uh, and one of the things that he draws out is the ships of Tarshish. And so this is Isaiah's vision. It's an eschatological vision, and in that vision. The ships of Tarshish are there, which are this, mm-hmm. you know, really troubling thing for the Israelites. Uh, and and they, they are there in this vision of a new Jerusalem. What do we make of that? How do we make, uh, how do we understand the fact that things that are recognizable, technological things and cultural things are somehow in this vision? And Mao has just, I think, wonderful insights into what it means that God has called us to be people who fill, right? So back in the cultural mandate in Genesis, God has called us to do something with the stuff of this world, to fill the garden. And one of the insights that comes from neo-Calvinism really plays this out in particular, is that that filling is not just having lots of babies, though having babies is in the cultural mandate too, but the filling is to do something with the potential of this world, to to make and to create and to do culture and, and, and create technology and politics and business and all of this stuff. And what does it look like at the end of times, when we go from a garden to a city and God, God is glorified and God makes all things new in a way that is, is not kind of outside of this filling, but redeems, restores, mm. and glorifies and, and transforms the building, the meager building that we have done. And, and that's not to say that we are the ones ushering in the kingdom. Very clear to say we are not. But God has called us to fill. And what does that mean as it relates to um, these eschatological glimpses that we get in scripture? So when the kings come marching in is, I think, a fabulous book on that that gives really, really helpful theological resources to kind of think through, what does this mean? Uh, How how will these meager things that we have made be transformed uh, by God's goodness in God's good kingdom? Uh, he also, Bob Inc. has this wonderful essay on common grace that I think, I mean, one of the things that we haven't talked about in depth, but is really important, uh, yeah, is, yeah. is this neo-Calvinist understanding of common grace. Bob Inc. has a few wonderful essays on common grace, what that means, why that matters. Um, a number of, of other things I think we could link to. There's been phenomenal work um, in translating some uh, relatively unknown texts of Bob Inc. to the English language lately by people like Grace Tantu, Corey Brock, highly recommend those. Uh, and and the last thing yeah, that the I'll, I'll recommend too. is 
Yeah, they do. And they, they recently came out with a book called Neo-Calvinism and Introduction. Uh, so I'd also recommend that to people wanting to get into kind of the theological weeds of what is this Neo-Calvinism? What did Bob and Kuiper say? Amazing. Amazing. Well, thanks so much, Jess. This has been just awesome. I I was like super excited for this episode. I have no idea. I'm like, it won't be super tech, but I don't care. I want it. <laughs> um, but I just think of how we can approach everything in our world and see our world more as an enchanted world, so to speak, mm-hmm. a world that exists in relation to God. Everything is religious and um, we can see it differently perhaps and see it as uh, mattering matter matters, mm-hmm. you know, to to the God who made it. Um, Joel, are we have we convinced you that uh, neo Calvinism <laughs> is something that's interesting and even helpful um, as a as a insight into the human world? I think like the one of the bigger things I took away is like as a technologist, um, you know, like as Jessica mentioned, there's a bias to things. Like even if you looked at Chat GPT, there are things that it won't answer because it has this filter on it. That prevents it from skewing a you know particular way racist or you know some other so there's there are biases to this technology and i think it's really interesting that you know you can be the ceo of a company and let's say you're going to a medical space you're going to get a doctor on your board to give you that insight into that domain so i think for technologists who are building things it really is valuable to have um, theologians <laughs> maybe join your company to fill that perspective on like, yeah, like how does neo-Calvinism or all of these other perspectives feed into what you're building? Um, and I've gained a lot from this. Well, thank you, Jess, so much for your time. Honestly, learned so much from you today. Uh, thank you as well to our listeners. Um, thank you also to our single Patreon supporter. Yes, we've launched a Patreon account. Um, we've launched a website as well, whatwouldjesustech.com. And yeah, we we are encouraging people if they have the means to do so and they are willing to do so, so to support us. There are costs that come with hosting and running a podcast. Um, we're happy to cover those costs, Joel and I, but hey, if you want to support us and encourage us um, by, by supporting us on Patreon, we would love that. Um, we'll also give you some bonus content for doing so. And so you can check that out. What would Jesus Tech Dot com and then you can see the the uh, ways that you can support us financially if you're so interested in doing so as well. But even listening is a blessing to us and we hope to be a blessing to you, encouraging you to use tech to find rest and to glorify God, the God of all things. Take care, guys. Bye.